on this for the last uh, four years or so, forgive me, but um, when I was brought aboard here at Union in the fall or summer of 2013, uh, Dr. Rick will remember this well, um, uh, one of the first things I brought up was, in a, I guess in a general sense, what's up with the playground? What's going on with that? I had my own daughters coming through here um, as elementary students, and I remember that was the talk of our, our, our groups of friends. Um, the condition of the playground, and I found out that that had been the case for many years before that. And we started an undertaking along with the community, um, a group of parent volunteers, many of whom are here tonight, to begin the process of beautifying, upgrading, and restoring our playground here at Union. Um, this was about four years ago, and we are now coming to the point where despite a, a number of ups and downs and a little bit of obstacles that we've hit, we're finally at the point where we're getting some answers and we think we've got the green light to go forward. So the point of tonight is to present the design ideas that we have in, that we have in place. We've got um, uh, Talia Stoneroff and Stephanie Hurley who are gonna lead off with a design update for both the lower and upper playground. They have a presentation for you. And then, we're going to um, hand hand the baton to Michael Namias. Michael, am I pronouncing that correct? Namias. Namias. Michael Namias and Kurt Miller, Kurt of the Johnson Company and Michael of the Department of Environmental Conservation, are going to be talking about the site soils and the process for remediation that um, uh, that we've been talking about for these last few months. Um, and then Sarah uh, McKernan is going to be talking about how folks can get involved in the process moving forward. Um, Sarah, Sarah, Talia, and uh, Stephanie are UES moms and have been with us from the beginning of this project. I'd also like to give a shout out to Kristen Darcy, Jenny Sheehan. Are there any other up moms or dads here? <laughs> but the, just to be really clear with everybody here, this is a totally volunteer endeavor. And I've just been honored to work alongside these folks for these last four years through the ups and downs. Um, um, I've not only been honored, but I've been inspired by it. Nobody's ever given up. We're here tonight, and we're excited to, to move forward. So with that, um, oh, and one thing about just kind of how the night is going to go, you're going to see at the end we have a question and answer period. Just to kind of move things along, we ask that you hold your questions until the end of the presentation, because many of them may be answered as the presentation moves forward. So if you just hold off on your questions, feel free to jot them down so you can remember, but we'll, we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. Okay? Thank you. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Talia and Stephanie. Um, let me pull that up. We are gonna turn the lights down to have a better visual. Um, Turn off the lights? Yep. Yeah. There we go. We got How's some colors. Is that color? Should we go dark all the way or? Um, if people need light in the back to see, I don't know. It's fine. Does so everybody that work for you guys? It'll look a lot better. Okay. So, um, I'm Stephanie Hurley and I am faculty at UVM in landscape architecture and Talia Stonerov is at Norwich University in architecture. So we've both been involved with aiding, reviewing, critiquing different iterations of the playground design. And what we're essentially considering the final design, we're hoping, we're not going to go back to the drawing board on this anymore, um, is 
based on a lot of the features that we're going to show here. It's not every single detail, but I want to give an overview. Um, and, and Talia is going to zoom in on some key areas. SE Group, a landscape architecture uh, and planning firm that's in Burlington, did this design. So we're you know, not claiming this design as our own. Um, but and Engineering Ventures, which is a civil engineering, engineering firm, also uh, contributed to design, so we're really happy with the work and to be able to be spokespeople for it. So one of the things we talked about initially, I don't know if you can see, there's not a ton of text, just the first few slides, um, <coughs> the idea of play principles. And my students actually, uh, UVM landscape design class, some of you may have seen their work two years ago, uh, came in to do some creative, inspiring ideas around what could happen with the upper and lower playgrounds. And we really gravitated, as did the whole UP committee, towards nature play um, and natural playground themes. And then some of the, the principles based on this book, Asphalt to Ecosystems, include having diverse play options, including hills and water and different things throughout the seasons. Play that's unstructured so that it's not the same thing every day. Um, movable parts and loose parts where, where the children have the option to modify their environment around them. Um, exploration, adventure, challenge, and strength building. So like the active, more physical stuff, as well as hideouts and open spaces to balance the kind of feelings of like, ooh, this is a special little corner versus this is wide open. We want to have some of each. Um, and then this idea of performance and, and places where, where kids can be uh, extroverts if they want to. <laughs> and the a notion that every surface is a play space, potentially. Like, as probably all of you know, kids will use things that were not designated as play areas to play on. So we wanted to sort of recognize that at the beginning. So here are just some examples of loose parts play. Um, and some of this is stuff that we probably have in our own uh, backyards and uh, things like pine cones, extra lumber, sandboxes, things that you can move around. Using natural features to really stimulate uh, creativity in play spaces. Um, there's a couple more images around the idea of nature play, so things like logs and boulders and rocks mixed in with plants and then some more traditional play structures you'll see too. Shelters and gathering spaces of different sizes because there are kids who want to use this space from the school and from the community at large for more sort of contemplative time and not always just racing around. Um, and I really like this quote, children learn as they play and most importantly in play, children learn how to learn and there's a lot of data and literature to back up this idea that playing can really be something that is educational. So with that kind of philosophical background, this is the very sort of flat computer drawn version of what we have, but this is what contractors need to build things. Um, and so I will kind of break this down into upper and lower playground. Uh, so this is kind of the, the pseudo final construction drawing version. And zooming in on the upper playground first, one thing to point out is, just to orient people, this is the front of the school here. Um, this is the cafeteria, like where we are basically in that direction. This area is a new deliberate switchback coming from the corner up here. Sorry. Um, <laughs> it's an awesome entrance. <laughs> it's so cool. That we're, we're being <laughs> so instead of people kind of hurling themselves down this hill slope willy nilly, it's deliberately a switchback system of a way to get down the hill from this corner um, up by State Street into the playground area. So that, that is something that's really key of mitigating that slope without having to officially walk all the way around. Um, and then some other features that aren't necessarily what you think of with play. This is a concept for an amphitheater that actually would kind of mix these aesthetics of more of a, a wood structure, but maybe intermixed with some like mobile lawn. It's still sort of the final version is under development, but the idea is this built into the hill slope gathering space where in theory you could probably fit the entire school to do an outdoor assembly or you could have events potentially on the weekend and just sort of have a space that is recognizing we have this big old hill that wraps the whole site, but what can you do with it that builds in function? Um, and then there's lots of sort of nature play themed areas, um, and then also some equipment that isn't necessarily like rocks and logs, but some more 
um, fun and different play equipment than what we have now. This is a, a slide that's um, built into the, the hill slope up here, um, where it's actually at grade. It's, uh, research is showing is a lot safer than having the slide fall into the air to just have it be onto the slope, but still get the, the rush. <laughs> um, and this is a, a large play structure idea, this sort of web-like thing um, that you can see in the plan view of, you know, a climbing structure that can probably fit 20 kids at a time. Just to, just to add yeah, to that, this was a structure that um, one of the parents on the committee had interacted with. And was it Sarah? I think it was. <laughs> yeah. And, it, and was really wowed by it. So saw kids using this structure. Um, thought it was so fantastic that she brought it to our committee. We researched it and were able to bring it in as one of the, the, the big items on the, the, the plan. Yeah, and I don't have pictures of this because this is this line, which looks like basically nothing. And plan view is a swing set. So all of these perimeters around the structures, like this one and the other, are based on sort of regulatory spacing, that how much space you need for people to run around safely around these structures. And this is kind of like the big bang of this uh, this playground in terms of new equipment that would have a lot of different alternative options. This just really quickly is an example of one of the two types of green infrastructure. This would be out in front of the school and these are uh, wire mesh filled gabion walls that are planted. And one of the other, aside from natural play goals that we have talked about from the very beginning, is dealing with the runoff in a more uh, ecologically friendly way. And so green stormwater infrastructure does that. I'm happy to talk to people about it more. It's my research expertise. Um, and these, these are structures, I've actually been to this one at uh, University of Connecticut, but people can kind of get on and sit on and they're multifunctional. Um, and so uh, mixing in the fact that the water that's, that's coming off is uh, not coming off of paved surfaces for the most part, but holding the water in the landscape and being more eco-friendly and doing that. And the other kind is this dry riverbed concept that is very popular from what I can see with, with kids of all ages. And there's something similar to this along here um, and is also in the center of the lower playground in the courtyard. So there's just a couple more pieces. To get into the lower playground a little bit, again, a, an altered entrance. I don't know how many of you have watched your kids run around this corner and just been like, I can't believe I'm just sending them out into that corner. Like, what is back there? You can't see, it's not welcoming, it's got dumpsters. So for fire lanes and other reasons, these dumpsters are being kind of staying here, being reconfigured and pushed back into the hill slope um, so that this becomes more of a, a retaining wall. And this should be a little bit more opening, uh, welcoming to the community with the new configuration of that entrance. Um, you'd still be able to come from the other direction as well. This is the idea of a large sandbox. We're, we're still maybe revising that a little bit to make sure it can be covered overnight with some kind of tarp system or a framed cover of some kind. But this idea of like lots of the younger kids getting in the sand and with boulders lining the perimeter. Some fun like kid appropriate, age appropriate, bouncy kinds of structures are shown in these bubbles over here. Um, this is uh, the more traditional play equipment, but with more natural um, materials as opposed to all metal and plastic, a lot more wood to be used in that piece of the design. There's other things in these designs I'm not highlighting just to give you a flavor here. This is another slide built into uh, an earthwork berm here. These kind of amoeba shaped, bean shaped things are, are raised earth. So there's like hills to go up and down, but this one has a slide in it as well. And up in the upper right corner is a, a design for a, a boat that's obviously not in water, but um, you can get this, the feeling of a pirate ship or setting sail. I didn't talk about this or the other playhouse that was outlined because it's coming up as a, a detailed um, piece of the presentation from Talia. And then just really quickly, um, this is that dry riverbed concept in the middle of the lower playground that I wanted to make sure we touched on as well. Hi, so I'm Talia Stonerov and I started this uh, project with Teresa Giffen, I think it was four years ago, as a parent and my child has since moved to the middle school. Um, I'm an architect in town but I'm also a professor at Norwich in architecture and um, I was really excited when this this became something that I could approach as a professor and have my students work on as well. So 
Um, the Playhouse, these are some of the precedents we're going to be researching. We, we are going to, uh, as a studio, I have 10 incredible students and I'm going to be leading them. Um, they will design and build a playhouse for this playground, and that will be completed by um, May this spring and ready to be installed whenever we are ready for it. So we're going to start the studio um, by looking at these precedents. Uh, there are incredible pieces of architecture out there that deal with play, um, that deal with tree houses. There'll be trees all around. Um, but the Playhouse is, is really, of course, about your children, our children. Um, and the students are going to be tapping back into that. I have these wonderful photos from Chris. It's about joy. So how, how do we bring joy into a piece of architecture? It's also about learning. So the Playhouse is going to be a space that teachers could come and bring classes and actually teach classes outside in the rain, in the snow, a space for, for learning. I have to explain this slide. So this was a big inspiration um, and some small moves that we did to the playground early on before we could approach this larger project. But this is uh, Brendan McLean's class that I happened upon. And here they are using these natural materials. Um, and, and he's created this amazing game completely with the students, of course. Uh, and it was, it was really an inspiration. So it's about engaging the outdoors. It's a treehouse. It's going to be a classroom, a space for play, and also a space for all children. So Stephanie noted um, the really wonderful path that's coming down from Hubbard and State Street. That is going to connect to, so here's that path coming down. Um, coming up from the playground, this is going to be ADA to about here. So this is a tree house that is going to be accessible for all children, which is, I think, a really exciting and important part of this. So here is a, just a, a little snapshot of where this part of the project is going to land. This little green box only represents about where it's going to be. So these incredible students I have are going to be designing this. Um, we're hoping to have some really fun structure interact with the bottom of it. It's all going to be engineered and permitted and inspected, don't worry. Uh, here's a zoomed in version so you can see this path coming up that will be ADA accessible. And so you'll be able to take a wheelchair from here and enter in. And here's a version just in, in section to show you. So we're going to be doing a lot of hard work, of course, and so some hard play as a playhouse. And I just wanted to finish with a, a larger version of these precedent images that I think are, are incredibly inspiring, pairing a lot of beautiful natural materials that, um, of course, Vermont are very rich in wood. We hope to use a lot of natural and local materials. And then also just reimagining surfaces and how um, the, the ground surface can become a really exciting space for play. I would just add the the second one that's shown on the hillside. Yes. Her class is going to design, yeah, so but would not be able to, in the time frame, also construct. Right. So over over in this area, yeah. in the lower playground, we're all go also going to be doing a separate course related same language, but a separate design for that as well. Good. Natalia and Stephanie, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> And Michael, uh, I'm going to pull up your presentation here. We have Kurt, and, uh, well, I'll let you guys introduce to your, yourself while I pull this up. Um, so I'm going to be giving the presentation this evening, and if there are any questions that are specific to for the Department of Environmental Conservation or the Department of Health. Um, Would you like me to do the, the I, I, music video? No, I'm going to. Yeah, 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 or whatever. You're right. Great. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kurt Muller. I'm a senior environmental engineer with the Johnson Company. We're located right here in Montpelier. Um, I'm going to speak to you a little bit tonight about uh, the soil assessment that's been done and the evaluation of the soils um, at the, the playground area. So just to give a little bit of an overview of tonight, I'm going to first start off with a, a history of the, the area, what's going on there historically, 
Um, then I'm going to get into an overview of the actual soil sampling that we've done, um, provide a summary of the results, discuss a little bit of the contaminant of concern that we identified, AHs, and then get into the next steps in corrective action planning. <coughs> so a little bit of history here. Um, in the early 1800s, there was a school by the name of the Montpelier Academy that is not shown here, uh, but that school reports that that school burnt down. And in the mid-1800s, this next school was built. And I've got several other photos. You're standing on Elm Street here, looking down School Street, and that's the old school building. And then in 1938, that school was torn down, and it was replaced by, by this school in 1940. So the reason I bring this up is, is the fact that we're not dealing with a, with a, a piece of property that, that is void of, of uh, human activity. There was a fire, there was demolition of a building, and, and as a result, there was likely fill that was brought in to regrade the surface soils, et cetera. So the next slide here, you can see here this is where the current school is, and this is where the footprint of the former school is. This is blue because it's just the blueprint that was overlaid on this, and I couldn't get it off the slide. But the reason I bring this up is we did sampling in this general vicinity here, and it's interesting to see where some of the results um, came in. And again, there was likely a lot of soil movement um, on the property over the years. So as we go through this presentation, there's some site features that I, I bring up. This is the courtyard area. Obviously, we're all pretty well aware of the upper ball field area. There's a steep grassy bank, and then this wooden steep slope in the back. So from a soil sampling perspective, um, the design engineers, particularly engineering ventures who I've worked with in the past, they uh, identified to me that there was a, a project going on and there was a lot of excess soil that was being, was to be generated. And when you're dealing with excess soil that needs to go off site, particularly in a developed area, it's not uncommon that that soil may con contain some typical urban contaminants. And as a result, um, it was important to understand for the purposes of a budget, what may be in that, that soil to then determine what the disposal costs may be. So I was brought on board to give a very broad brush to provide a broad brush pre-disposal characterization. So basically sampling the soil to say, what's in it here, and, and if we need to get rid of it, what might it cost? So this was um, a, a series of samples that were collected in a composite manner. So we collected several from a lot of different locations and put them together. And that's what the, 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 the landfills require. Bottom line is, we sampled for everything under the sun. We sampled for PCBs. We sampled for volatile organic compounds. We sampled for herbicides and pesticides and metals. And basically, the only contaminant of concern that we identified were these PAHs. And the next slide, I'm getting into what they are. So, um, but, but so the good news is there was only one contaminant that was identified. So as a result, as follow-up, in, in August and September of 2017, there was some supplemental sampling done. And this was done much more in a finite way to better understand where they are and, and how broad, uh, what the concentrations are in these various locations and also determine how deep they are. So um, that's, that happened in August and September of 2017 and we got the results back. And again, so PAHs were the primary contaminant of concern. But we did also sample for arsenic and lead again, given the fact that you, know, you have lead-based paint and Leaded gasoline was used historically. Possibly lead could be an issue. And also arsenic. Arsenic can be found in herbicides and pesticides. And it's also a naturally occurring element um, that, that's found in soil. So we did evaluate arsenic and lead. Unfortunately, they, were not, um, they did not exceed the applicable concentrations. So back to this PAH. These are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. It's a big word. All it basically is is, is the exhaust product of the combustion or burning of hydrocarbons. And hydrocarbons could be in the form of wood, they could be in the form of coal, they could be in the form of fuel. But think of you know, the, the locomotive in the, in the middle of the century spewing soot, and that, that soot would then fall out and, and be deposited on the ground surface. But we also find PAHs, campfires, wood-burning stoves, uh, uh, vehicle exhaust. So these are relatively ubiquitous contaminants that are often found in urban areas. You also can be exposed to PAHs on charred meat. Um, so I'm not trying to in any way, shape, or form 
uh, suggests that they're, they're not important, they shouldn't be evaluated. There certainly is a standard for a reason, but I'm just trying to get a, give you a sense of um, that, that this contaminant we're exposed to in many different facets of our lives. So back to the sampling effort. This was the follow-up sampling that we did in the fall. Um, in, the up, in the upper playground, there were 16 borings, and a sample was collected in three different depth intervals, zero to two, two feet, two to four feet, and four to six feet. We did something similar over here in the courtyard area, again, zero to two, two to four, four to six. And then we did some, some shallower sampling, just the zero to two zone over on the bank. And the reason we selected those intervals was based on the preliminary designs, what soil would be disturbed, and how would we manage that soil. We also sampled deeper in a few locations, and I'll get into that in a minute, but, but that was the primary. So now we're looking at the soils from the zero to two zone. Again, no arsenic or lead exceedances, but we did have PAH exceedances. And the Vermont Department of Health developed a site-specific standard for this, for the use of this, this property and what would be applicable uh, for the school. And as a result, we compared to that standard and of the, the 31 grids that we sampled, five exceeded that threshold. The school proactively put a, a fence up uh, in this general vicinity here, and there were some wood chips that were spread. As we get a little bit deeper into the two to four foot zone, again, no arsenic or lead exceedances, but now we have six zones that exceeded that, that Vermont Department of Health threshold for PAHs. If you recall, the building, the former building was approximately here, and I'm not, again, I'm not, I can't say definitively that it was a result of that building being there and, 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 and whatnot, but it just is kind of a coincidence. And as we get a little bit deeper, now we only have two, uh, I'm sorry, three grids that, that exceeded that threshold. And, and as I mentioned prior, there were some deeper samples that were collected, and the only reason we collected those was that was the soil that would be in communication with groundwater, and we just wanted to be certain that these, these soils, if they were impacted, wouldn't adversely impact the groundwater quality. And fortunately, through the analysis, it proved that no, groundwater would not be impacted by the presence of these contaminants. It's important to note that these PAHs in particular are not very mobile. They tend to bind the soils relatively tightly. So with that being said, um, they, don't, they don't beach out, I mean, they do to some extent, but not readily. And, um, and, and, and so groundwater is not, groundwater impacts as a result of this contamination is not a concern. So next steps. We're in the process of, of developing strategies for manage, managing the soil. So through collaboration with uh, DEC and the school and the design engineers, essentially what was determined is if the material exceeds is purple, you know, through the figures, it, it exceeds this Vermont Department of Health standard that it would be removed of and disposed, disposed of off-site. If the soil is below that standard, um, it could remain on-site. And the upper 18 inches of soil, the surface soil, would be confirmed to be comprised of material that does not exceed that Vermont Department of Health threshold. So then as we transition from the soil management discussion, then we actually get into the formal corrective action plan. And so what we would do is evaluate various alternatives and compare the effectiveness of, of how that process would work or that, that strategy would work, the aesthetics, the feasibility, and, and the cost as well. And then once the school collect, um, determines, uh, selects a, a cleanup strategy, uh, then a formal corrective action plan would be written. So this is a formal document. And there's a 30-day public comment period, so there's an opportunity for the public to, to review that and address that. And then if need be, um, a, a public meeting could certainly be arranged to discuss that and, and the reasoning for why said, said approach was selected. So finally, once that document's approved and signed off on, um, it gets implemented. And it would be implemented concurrently with construction. So it's not a situation where those purple soils, so to speak, get dug out and then we walk away. There's, there's some, to some extent, oversight to ensure that at the end of the project, we can, with confidence, say that we have a clean surface of 18 inches or greater everywhere on the, on, the, on, the, you know, on the playground. And I say 18 inches, that's where the soil will be located. If you've got a, uh, 
impervious feature like a, a concrete or an asphalt, that would then also satisfy that, that barrier. But that wouldn't be 18 inches thick. That would be more like 6 inches thick. Um, so ultimately, what would happen is there'd be a professional oversight professional that would uh, confirm that, again, this corrective action plan was implemented uh, as, as approved. And there'd be an as-built drawing and confirmation and sign-off that, indeed, you know, these are the, this is what we have, and this is a safe playground. So um, that's essentially the overview. And I look forward to receiving any questions later. Great, Kurt. Thank you very much. Sure. That's great. great, great. Um, the, the next uh, segment here, I want to introduce uh, Tom Wood, the facilities director for Montpelier Public Schools, and Sarah McKernan, one of our up. Uh, leaders, fearless leaders, and they're going to be talking about kind of the next steps, timeline that's coming up with this, and also ways in which those of you who are interested can jump in and help out with the Union Playground project. So, Tom and Sarah? Do you want to, can you pull up the... Yes. I do. We're, we are going to be very brief and want to really open up with lots of time for everybody to uh, get their questions answered. I did, yeah. So everybody just look away because you're about to see my email for uh, the entire <laughs> What could possibly be on there? All right, hang on, Sarah, 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 quickly, Sarah slides. There we go. Everybody look away? All right. Well, so maybe I'll just dive in. Oh, yes, perfect. That's it. Um, you know, the first thing I just wanted to start out by saying is that many of you have been hearing about this project for a little while. We have some newer parents in our midst from you know, pre-K parents and kindergarten parents, and it's, it's so exciting to be able to invite you all um, into learning about this project. There are also a number of parents that are sitting here that started hearing about our, our grand ideas for really developing a great new playground for our kids, you know, really starting three years ago. Um, and I just wanted to, to put up Rosie the Riveter here <laughs> to say, you know, we really believe we can do this project. And it has, and that we can do it this summer. You're gonna, Tom's gonna walk you through a schedule um, in a minute and uh, show you exactly kind of what we're thinking about the timing um, and, and what we need to do from a funding perspective. But we really do believe that we can do it. We're at a moment in time where we could really use a little extra help and that's the piece I'm gonna talk to after Tom gives you some context about timing and, um, and money. Uh, because there is a lot to do with a project like this and um, we're just at a moment in time where we think it would be great to get some more parents involved. And there are lots of ways to plug in, lots of ways in which we could use help. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you a sense of that uh, in just a minute. But I, I wanted to just reflect on a, a metaphor that I'll probably botch that Kurt has given the, the little parent team that's been meeting uh, with him and, uh, and now with the uh, regulatory agencies, Department of Environmental Conservation and the Department of Public Health, about when you encounter a soils issue and you have to deal with it, um, it can quickly feel like it's kind of taking over the project because it does add some process that we have to go through with the ultimate outcome of just making sure that our kids are playing on a really safe and clean playground. So all that work is totally worth it. But at times it can feel like, well, where's the playground project in all of this? Um, and Kurt has this great metaphor about, you know, it's kind of like when you are going to renovate your house and you have this beautiful vision uh, and you discover you've got, you know, some dry rot in a, in a joist or you've got some knob and tube wiring that you've got to deal with. And that's really what we're trying to um, to think about with respect to this soils issue. We've got a lot of help from our agencies now, from the Department of Environmental Conservation and the Department of Health, and they're here tonight to answer your questions. Um, they are really gonna be involved in a technical process with Kurt, who's been an enormous help to the project, uh, to worry about and think about what we do with those soils and get a great plan in place for us. Um, and that's all going to go forward, uh, but we still have that great vision, and that's and and we're going to do it. And that's why it was really important to show you the design tonight, and to remember all those great ideas that are coming this summer. Um, so, Tom will give you a little some of the sure. specifics. <clears throat> Thanks, Sarah. 
I thought I'd give everybody a little bit of recap in terms of some of the financial commitments that have already been made to the project, uh, just because, this, as everybody has mentioned, we've been doing this for a couple of years now. And um, one of the initial uh, endeavors by uh, a parents group here was to apply for a land and water conservation fund, which we were awarded almost two years ago, the value of 100, it's, it's approximately $150,000. And so we've been awarded some grant money because of the improvements we're doing here with the stormwater infrastructure and the demonstration site in terms of the green infrastructure that we're doing. So it's something we wanted to leverage to be able to you know, make the playground even better than it, than it currently is. In addition to that, we've had tremendous support already from the school board in terms of giving us the seed money to be able to get through the regulatory process. Originally, it started with being able to have enough money to be, do, to be able to do the design charrettes and be able to generate the concept design and the, and the design documents for the playground. But through that process, it was the discovery of the soils issue and it's led us to further uh, in soils investigation work in that regard. But the school district to date has given us originally a $45,000 uh, infusion of money to get that process started and then they ended up backing it up with a $10,000 uh, contribution to be able to help us do the initial soil sampling that Kurt mentioned that started the investigation that started to identify the, the need for even more more sales work. And then originally there was an allocation of, of existing fund balance for the school board of $250,000 to be able to take a shot at getting the first phase of this constructed. That was back before we fully understood the magnitude of the soils issue we were um, getting ourselves into, both in terms of the, the money involved to solve it and the time involved to be able to identify it and address the concerns that we're, uh, we're doing right now. In addition to that, there has been numerous activities here in the school through various parent group organizations to, to you know, solicit donations from uh, uh, families as well as local businesses to try to sell, you know, to, to help build the, the playground. So there were fundraising campaigns that went on last year. There's still some plan that are planned for in the coming year to be able to give some private money to the project. So today, you know, there, there's almost a half million dollars that's been allocated for this project. And we're still trying to get a handle on what the total cost is going to be, and there is a, a shortfall in terms of where the, the total cost for this project is going to be. And we're in the process of, over the next two two weeks to two months, of trying to identify what that total value is. And we'll be working with the, the leadership team to identify that and bring it to the school board to come up with a strategy for how to, how to fund the balance of the, the playground work. But with that said, so where we are in terms of process. You know, the final design and bid package preparation. We've been working on this for, a, certain amount of time, but right now we do, with some reasonable degree of certainty, you know, look at about a 90-day window here to be able to finish the soils investigation, finish the cap design, to be able to get the regulatory criteria, to be able to finish the design, to be able to get um, uh, to a point where we can have a bid package to go out and solicit uh, competitive proposals from, from contractors to build this project. Concurrent to that, we still have to go through a regulatory process to be able to get a local uh, city of Mount Pelier uh, site plan approval permit, uh, a zoning permit, because we're not building any construction here. And we still need to be able to go to the state to get a state uh, general permit and a stormwater permit. So those processes can happen concurrent to us going through the solicitation and bidding process, but we want to wait a couple of months still before we, uh, so we understand exactly if there are uh, yet to be determined criteria that the cap may put on us. We want to make sure that we incorporate that into the right um, you know, permit applications. So we don't have to go back and amend permits once we've been once they've been acquired. So our goal right now is to finish the the bid package design process by about mid February, so that between January 15th and February 15th we can finalize the preparation of all the permit applications that need to go in, so we can start those uh, down their regulatory process for final review. Concurrent to that, we're going to be, you know, the goal right now is to get bid packages together by uh, April 15th is the target to be able to solicit uh, proposals from potential contractors by May 15th with the desire to start construction of this, you know, on or about the end of school. Um, and right now, you know, that seems possible, uh, but what we've learned in the last couple of years, there are a lot of variables here, we're juggling a lot of balls, and this is our, our schedule that we're going to try to implement. But Six months ago, I couldn't tell you with any certainty that this was a realistic schedule. And now I can stand before you and say that I feel re reasonably certain that we can actually, you know, work towards the schedule. And that we've identified a lot of those variables that we have no control over. And now we're, we're, you know, quickly, you know, finalizing the details so we know exactly what we need to do to satisfy the regulatory concerns. So. 
So uh, I just mentioned that we're, we're looking for parents that are inspired to get involved and help out in some way. And helping out could look like doing a little something on your computer while a kiddo naps. And it could look like joining a subcommittee that's meeting once a month to do a task. Um, I want to give you uh, tonight just an idea of where we are looking for some extra help. Um, and you're, you should have on each table um, a, a sheet that just says, if you're interested, if you think you might want to get involved, you don't even have to be sure. Um, put down your name tonight and your email and give us an idea of what you like to do, where your skill set is that you think might be helpful to us, and then we'll get in touch with you. Um, so uh, here are some areas where we think we are needing some help. Um, Tom mentioned we have a funding gap. Uh, the funding gap is both about how are we going to address the soils, but it's also just about building a project that is a large project with two full playgrounds, lots of new play equipment. You saw the amazing ideas in, in our design. So, um, so there are fu there's a funding gap related to both the playground aspects of the project and the brownfields aspects of the project, the soils issues. There are specialized sources of funding that help with brownfields, both loans and grants, and we are really looking into those. We already have one from the Central Vermont RPC to help us with the sampling and with the development of this corrective action plan. So that piece will be funded with grants and loans, and also the district may supply uh, funding to help with that piece as well. But we're still pursuing funding sources um, from uh, other places that will help us build and get all the great structures and play equipment that we want. So there are a few grant opportunities out there we know about that we still want to pursue, and we think some of them are really good live options. And so we're looking for people who like to do grant work, who can help us research grants, but especially we've got a few in mind, and we're looking for people who can help us put together, do some writing, um, maybe go and talk to a grant review committee. So if you like that kind of stuff, or you have some expertise in it, Think about helping out. Um, and it's scalable to what you have available <laughs> in terms of time. We want to uh, mobilize a business sponsorship effort in this community. Um, we really haven't tapped that potential source of funding at all. And we're not talking about the small businesses downtown. We know they get asked by just dozens and dozens of worthy causes every year. I'm thinking about, we're thinking about more the big employers in the area, um, the kind of national lives of our region. Um, and we want to put together a sponsorship package. We think we can offer them great visibility right in a, in a physical way in the new playground. Uh, and so we're looking for parents who might help us develop a sponsorship package and go and visit with a business or two. You could just sign up to visit with one business if that's all you have time for. Um, each one of these are probably going to become little subcommittees and we're going to have a lead for each and we already have some ideas about who's going to do that uh, leadership work. And then lastly, um, Did I go too fast? no, no, that's perfect. Just keeping the community informed, especially as this project has grown in complexity, um, we're really, we know that we need to do a better job of keeping everybody up to date about what's happening. How's the schedule looking? Are we on track? What's going to happen this summer? So we're, we're uh, standing up a website. Jolinda Burton, who's pretty new in our community, has jumped right in and is helping us uh, put up a website where we can post uh, updates about the project. We're also going to look to do a Donate Now uh, or Donate Here uh, button. If people want to give a contribution to the playground, they can do it right on our website. And, um, and then we're, you know, we, we need to be keeping the board up to date and um, keeping city council up to date. Uh, so people who are interested in that community engagement piece, the communications and community engagement, let us know. And lastly, um, there's some real energy for trying to do some short-term stuff in the, in the lower playground. Um, Jenny Sheehan, in particular, is, who's here and has been and part of this effort from the beginning, 
um, is really interested in, in organizing and mobilizing some parents to try to make some short-term improvements to that lower playground because there is so little there for our kiddos right now. And in fact, we just had to fence off a piece of it because of the soil. So it's even smaller than it was and it really lacks interest for pre-K and kindergarten kids. So if you feel like you want to figure out what do we do with this space in the short term? Can we get some stuff donated? Can we spiff it up? Can we make it more interesting? Let us know. Um, that's all I want to say. I know we, we really need to turn to questions. But there are sign-up sheets. Uh, and if, I might need to bring a few back there. We didn't, we're pleased to see so many folks here. So we may not have quite enough yeah, sheets around. Um, um, there is one, uh, one up. Uh, parent came in a little bit later, so we give a shout out to Terry Holloway, who's over there. Terry, sorry to single you out, but you deserve to be singled out. Uh, and again, the, the, the volunteer efforts that have been going on for the last four years here, um, and with all the ups and downs, it, it has been so impressive and inspiring. But we do need your help with all of these things. In fact, the spiffing up the lower playground, I've already talked to a number of the people in this room about some of your ideas, and we welcome them as we go into the winter and the in the, in the spring ahead. So with all of that in mind, we, uh, we're a little ahead of schedule, which is always nice. Um, if, 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 uh, and I also want to thank um, Stephanie and Talia and Kurt and, and Tom and, and, and Sarah for your presentation. You guys put a lot of time into that and really, really bringing people up to speed and I thought in a beautiful way. So thank you to all of you guys. Um, and with that, questions. Um, I think we're going to have to do it kind of popcorn style. There are a lot of experts in the room here are going to be able to help and if you have questions I'll just try to answer them in order or pick on people in order. So raise your hand if you have any. Yes. Oh and you'd be great to introduce yourself if once uh, once I call on you. So yeah. Um, I'm Claire Buckley and I um, first graders and um, I have a question about the Department of Health setting the level site specific standards. Yeah, well, I mean, why is the Department, of, I have a little bit of you know, environmental law background, and I'm like, why would the Department of Health be setting a standard? As luck would have it, Claire, we have representatives from the Department of Health here with us. <laughs> <laughs> so I am happy to defer, folks, uh, to you. Well, so I'm Trish with the Vermont EC in the Sites Management Section. And when we have a site or a property where there's a potential impact to essentially the community or population, we work with the Department of Health on how to best. Um, <laughs> convey any information based on the time that is there and what any impacts are. And so the Department of Health actually moved to look into what that concentration would be and provided that background to us. Um, and Sarah and Dr. Rose can talk about what went into that value, but we do work with the Department of Health a lot coming up with say, specific numbers that actually take into account what the so, I mean, ultimately, I guess my question is, is it based on, like, you know, federal law or anything like that? I mean, you know, we work on state law, so okay, not federal law. Um, but Sarah can tell you what went into that number, that's what you're asking. But the state decides what the community values are. Yeah, okay. I, I, it was just odd to me that the Department of Health would decide what criteria. It sounds like the DEC is doing So the, the Department of Health gives us all, almost all our values. Yeah. That we use um, <laughs> and if we ask for a site specific value, then the Department of Health will take all of the information that's specific to us by use and come up with a, a value that's protected. And I guess that, that's kind of, I, I'll follow up on that and why I was asking that, um, which obviously I think probably a lot of parents in this room are probably wondering if you haven't been involved in this, is, is the criteria, I mean, is it, do you feel like right now, especially where you're going to dig everything up, and where the kids are out there playing right now, I mean, what is the status of the safety of right now? So right now, safety, all of the areas that have continuous are covered or restricted and or restricted. That, that, that playground, and Tom put some more wood chips down on that soil and they did fence it off. Um, so right now, the playground is safe. 
doesn't meet the current cleanup requirements that we have, which, which basically dictate the level of clean that we see on top of anything that's contaminated. And so that's what it's doing in the production. But where you have the kids touching the soil, playing in the soil, all of that soil right now, except for purple areas, they're covered with good chips. There's no drug contact to the soil. Um, I, I, I can. Um, so I'm the toxicologist at the health department, so I work in the environmental health division. Um, we do work a lot with DEC um, when they ask us for health protective criteria to clean up chemicals in air, um, so, sometimes in air, but in water and in soil, we work together. So we don't have the authority to require cleanups and to, you know, we don't work individually with sites, but we do help DEC make health protective values so that you know, we as a state are cleaning up chemicals. Um, do you want to talk about the specifics about, yes. The site specific standard is more stringent because it's a school mm, okay. versus sort of like, oh, it would be nice to get rid of some soil. I mean, yeah. is it more? Yeah, so typically when we, when we work with DEC, we create standards that are based on residential exposure because it's, it's one scenario that we know if, you're, if your soils are below the residential criteria where you're exposed uh, 24-7, 350 days a year for your whole lifetime, if you're below that, then we're pretty confident there's no issue there. So the site-specific um, request comes from DEC when there's an exceedance of one of those values that's based on a residential scenario, but DEC looks at it or a consultant looks at it and they say, this is not residential. So our kids, sometimes it feels like they live at school, but they're not here um, it's not the same scenario. Um, when, we, when we develop these, uh, these cleanup standards, it's based on two different pieces of information. One is the toxicity. So there are lots of animal studies that we use to understand how toxic is a chemical and there are specific doses that come from those studies. So that's kind of one piece, the toxicity, but the other piece is the exposure. So there is a big difference in being exposed at your home every day versus being exposed to school. The exposure scenario for school is less stringent than the exposure scenario at home because you spend more time at home than you do at school. Um, so for this particular request, we did work with um, all the great people here who gave us a lot of information about what ages the children are that go here how often they're here, and how many days or how many hours per day they're here. So we took all that information and we created what's, a, what's called a reasonable maximum exposure. So you know, reasonable meaning it's, it's realistic. We're not assuming that every kid is here 365 days a year, so we know that's not reasonable. Um, but it is maximum. So we assume that the kindergartners, kindergartners through fourth grade were here nine hours a day. You know, so we, we, built our scenario to cover the kids who were here from preschool on to kindergarten through fourth grade and in the after school program. So we built the most most exposure we could into the scenario. Does that, yeah? So along those lines, there's no standard for the state of Vermont for say schools. So, so you had to develop Trish answer it, but yeah. Our standards are specific for residential scenarios and industrial commercial scenarios. Okay, so I'll ask you a question about that because the DEC published a report in April in which they did a statewide background levels for arsenic, lead, and PAHs. And the number that they came up for PAHs for resident, for uh, industrial areas was 580 parts per million, which so, is lower than the 720 that you adopted for this site. So I'm just wondering, how you came up with 720? It's actually not industrial areas. It's, okay. It's urban centers. So places where you have a lot of homes or activities. So if you go to the agency in our atlas, there's something that the agency of commerce put out there that shows you where your um, developed areas are throughout the state. And those areas are under, um, it's the habitable buildings layer on the map, and we took that layer and said, here's where there's a lot of housings or other development in, in downtown, and said, the number of samples that we took from these locations versus the areas outside of that, like in 
state parks. Um, this is the difference between those, and that is what the studies background money. There's no health statistics involved in that at all. Right. Um, it's just what a background calculates for pH in those areas. Right. And the background, the background value for commercial slash industrial was 580 parts per billion, and the residential was 26 parts per billion. So, that so actually, how did you get to 720 from 580? It's actually rural and urban is the way it should be. I don't know if that really Well, well <laughs> we can look at the table, but yeah, it was something like that. But there were two numbers, Correct. residential, rural. that's outside the urban areas, and then inside the urban areas, Correct. and the number was 580. Correct. Now, it doesn't affect the results here, because if you look at the plot, uh, the the green square, the green polygons, or the purple polygons, it's essentially the same. You still have the same number of uh, borings that exceeded the value, whether it's 580 or 720, but it gets back to your question before, how do you choose that number? Well, so that's a completely different process from what we do. So what Trish just explained is that the state was required to figure out what is, quote, background. So they went around, took a bunch of samples, and what's the average level? So what we do is we look at how are you exposed to the chemical? Um, how much dust do you eat every day? Because believe it or not, when your kids play outside, they eat dirt. When they come inside, they eat dirt. We look at how much dirt sticks to a child's skin and gets absorbed into their bodies that way. So we looked at the surface area of a, of a child, you know, all these different parameters that are, you know, well, they make up quite large equations. And we looked at how much of the chemical volatilizes into the air. So how much do you breathe in? So we look at, so we do a lot of um, equations looking at um, how this chemical gets into your body to determine um, the level. So it's really two different processes that are not at all related. I see that you had a question. Want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm Lauren Hurl, a first grader here. Uh, I was just following up on that. Like if, if there was, like what was the range or what you showed as the green areas, like would, if there was a uh, more protected or a lower standard, like mm -hmm. having to go back to the green and purple. So, would it be uh, more purple, uh, or was it like the body with spikes? If if we were going with the 0.5, yeah, can you use like how how the, the, the urban you know, background how value? How sensitive to that standard or the different in the whole area, like a little bit contaminated, or is it really? From, if we were to go with that urban background value, that 0.58, of, of, for all three of those layers, there were two squares that changed. So there was one value that I believe was 0.61. So it was, it was above urban background. Now that one is below the BDH value. So and there's another one like that. I'm not specifically sure exactly where it was, but there were two that were changed. This is the zero to two feature. So, so 
leaching into the building, um, we look at those issues when we have more of the ball coming from it. So something that's in the ground will volatilize the vapors will come into the building and the cage is not one of those chemicals. Um, they are, as Kurt mentioned, they like to adhere to dust particles or dirt particles, and that's why the Department of Health looked at you know, how much you invest or eat or anything like that, and they'll stay on the, on the dirt particles. So it's not Yes. Um, so just to shift gears, if that's okay. I had a question about, um, I love, oh, sorry, uh, Jill Briggs in the kindergarten. I'm new to the community. Um, I love the idea of the nature playgrounds, but I have observed, uh, like, the elementary school over in Waterbury has sort of the nature playground. It takes a lot more wear and tear than our kind of old school metal and plastic and rubber. Um, so is, have, I'm sure y'all have already been thinking about this, but um, is there like funding contingency for the replacement? You know, I, I noticed even just the maintenance years, and the, like the concrete yep. little hobbit holes were falling apart mm -hmm. and there's splinters and that kind of thing. So Clearly going to have to be part of the plan. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, sort of looked 25 years old as opposed to two or three years old. So I was just wondering what your thoughts are on that and where you're at. Well, well, I think, and I welcome any up members and Tom, uh, anybody who wants to uh, mention this, but it, it's clearly going to have to be part of the plan. Uh, a maintenance plan is going to have to shift the way we do our, take care of our grounds here. It's going to require a lot more day-to-day -day, um, and seasonal maintenance, if not to mention the structure, structures themselves, but also the landscape. You know, all that stuff is going to need to be factored in. We've been actually talking about that from the beginning of the project. Um, so. Definitely aware of it. Yeah, I think that there's also, um, I think maybe that we focused on some of the more natural elements, but they're, they're, those are in some ways the logs and the, they're the less expensive pieces, and there are some big uh, items that are purchased and you know, made for playgrounds and have a very um, a long, uh, long life to them. Um, so I think. Those, those, the items that are are ending up costing more are the ones that are, are going to be have very long life. Um, but I, we have been discussing that from the beginning. The it's a really good question, though, and it, it's something that um, we have to be aware of. Um, I don't know if the Thatcher book folks factored all that stuff in. Is that what you're talking about, the Thatcher? Yeah. 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 And it, yeah. it was a great idea, but it was just sort of melting on them. Yeah. <laughs> With the playhouse um, specifically. The students will certainly be thinking about the longevity, longevity of the materials, but also where they're locally and their carbon footprint. So there probably won't be a lot of plastic, and although we know that plastic will be around forever. Um, so it's going to be all those things factored in, but certainly maintenance is, is, is going to be an issue. It's a great, it's a great point. Maybe just to add one more thing. It looks like Tom might be going right where I'm going. So you Take it away. Well, I was just going to mention specifically that you know, the, in anticipation of the district last year, the FY18 budget actually created a line item in our, in our school budget for grounds maintenance because it had been an under addressed issue for a number of years. In anticipation, at least this year, we have a line item in the FY19 budget. We're starting to incrementally you know, ratchet that up a little bit. So we're actually identifying the need and putting these money towards it. We've also started generating with workloads in terms of the staff here, we're going to have to be able to put some man hours out there to maintain what we have and not just throw money at it. So you know, we're anticipating that we're going to have to spend some more time to keep it clean, keep it presentable, and safe. Uh, and safe. You know, so good question, but we are we are thinking about it. You had a question. Yeah, you know, Victor was on the counter the second group. Thank you all for your kind of work and great information. That's just a specific question about the remediation. Do you actually remediate based on those core samples so you'll go deeper where it's more hazardous specifically, and then historically, as you start dating, do things come up that you didn't see in the first place? Treasure. Let's think optimistically.
any of the contamination on the site. So the soils aren't going to continue to cause an impact to groundwater. They're not a vapor issue, so they're not going to go into the building. Um, they're not going to continue to migrate off-site and cause additional issues. So as long as those conditions are met, we are okay with soils staying in place that are still contaminated as long as they're managed appropriately. And that's where we require any soils that stay in place to have an 18 inch clean soil cap on top of it with a geotextile barrier or marker below that, or the six inches of clean fill and asphalt or concrete on top of that. So those are our general requirements. And then based on those requirements, the site design work has been kind of played into that. And so if you're digging deeper on the site, there's extra excavation that's going to happen with the soil of those soil contaminants. But um, that's, that's our general premise. As long as what is there isn't going to continue to cause a long-term issue, then then these is OK with it. And these soils will not cause a long-term impact to the environment if they're at that. So we only need to remediate the places that you plan on digging? Correct. Yeah, if it's above the Department of Health. Do you need a question? Uh, Tina Lundy, I'm on the school board, and I'm curious. Uh, we did hear that we wouldn't have to eliminate some contaminated soil, and by the way, no one would take it. So have we solved that problem yet? Um, I don't know why you heard that. <laughs> uh, the, the material that is purple up there would be acceptable in a landfill, and the pre-characterization work that we did back in the spring to analyze for everything under the sun all those values were suggestive that they, it was below what their threshold would be, and they could take it and they could actually use it as an alternative daily cover, which is something that they need, and that, that mitigates odor at the landfill and also protects bird populations. The bottom line is it's a, a little bit cleaner material than the material would actually get landfilled, and that being said, is it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a more cost-effective way. It's cheaper to get rid of it if they use it as an alternative daily cover. So it would be acceptable. You shouldn't have heard that it's, it's unacceptable in any way, shape, or form. Okay. Yes. How much soil is actually going to be removed? Are you going to be like digging little holes, or are you going to be going two feet, scraping all this up, and removing all this dirt? You know, how much? I mean, we're not building a building out here. You know, most of it's going to be above ground. You know, but your posts are going to be, you know, four holes. Are you going to get rid of that dirt? Is that what you're disturbing? Or you're looking to clear out two feet of the whole playground and then fill the whole playground with clean dirt? What, what dictates the, the volume of excess soil is the design. So um, if, if, there was, if we weren't doing anything to the playground whatsoever, the five purple squares could get dug out and replaced with, with other material that was below that. Vermont Department of Health threshold, and, and it would be, it would be yeah, there'd have to be fabric in between, I apologize. But my point is, the, the actual amount of material that is coming out is dictated by the design. And so the, the design team's working on um, what the net cut will be, or the amount of excess material, and it's quite a bit. It's, it's yeah, but let, let's say you're just putting up a swing set and the posts that go in, that's the only part of the soil that's disturbing, really. So are you going to remove just the soil for the posts, or are you going to dig all the way around everywhere for two feet for that swing set? How much, to, you know, because that's, it, it, you're only disturbing a little for the post. My understanding is, is the project design will result in a significant grade change, and there's also material that is currently there that doesn't support vegetation. So there will be material imported that will be Topsoil that would be would provide better organic content for them for, for, for grass to grow. Um, so I guess when, to answer your question specifically about the swing set, if if we were to be in a situation where we're digging just the post for the swing set, the material that came out at depth, if it was purple, that would be disposed of appropriately. However, the surface around the swing set, you're going to be guaranteed to have an 18-inch surface of soil that is free of contaminants that are above the BDH value. So does that answer your question? And how much per yard is that clean soil going to run? We have where the design <laughs> team is um, secure. 
Uh, they're, they're looking currently at what's the most cost effective measure. Right. So does it make the, the most sense to for, for or that? that. <coughs> it's it's topsoil. I mean, it's, it's your, it's the, so the top do you soil. have to inspect your topsoil from where you get it to? It would be certified. We're, we're working. <laughs> Am I good? Okay. Uh, my question is about, and I've, we've kind of, I've been with following this for a long time, but um, the funding, if the funding gap is not met by the time construction is set to begin on the project this coming June or whenever, um, what is the plan? What is, is there going to be a graduated rollout and wait for the rest of the funding? Or are we going to try to get all of the funding in place before we start the ball rolling? My name's Emma. I have a first grader here. Aaron. Would you like to tackle that? I don't mean to pass that. No. Okay. Well, I mean, that's an open question. I mean, right now, the intention is to try to fund the playground. And so, you know, that, that the primary mechanism right now that the school board is considering is, is a improvement bond. And so that, that is going to take on a life of its own in terms of the identifying the value which we haven't done yet, including as part of a capital improvement bond and whether the community supports that or not is yet to be determined. So, so has that already has that improvement bond, bond already been discussed at the school board level? No, we're in the process of introducing over the next couple months. Well, yes, we have talked about the bond quite a bit, but we don't yet have a final. The bottom line number. Yeah, right. And we don't. We have many other school board meeting about the capital improvement bond so there is so anybody that's interested in hearing that discussion about how to balance the different capital priorities um, for you know what goes into that proposed bond measure and and how the playground might um, be put in and at what level it might be a good idea to to come and, and listen to the board discuss it and so the, que the original question was about is there, so if we don't come up with the money, all of it, does that mean we're pushing out another year maybe? Or we, that hasn't been decided yet? Because last year it was discussed that maybe the upper level playground would be done first or and then it shifted, maybe the lower playground would be done first because we do have enough money to do one or the other. Um, the plan so shifted that, toward getting it done all at once. All at once. So that's sort of the game plan as it stands, all or nothing. As right Michelle now. said, depending on where that bottom line comes out, we just don't know. <laughs> and, and we, we will need help. Uh, we will need help getting that bond passed. Um, we don't need help. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think um, I'm not sure if you're Yeah, I'm really rough, and I have a second grader here. I, I have two questions. Number one is, we don't know what the funding gap is. Right? I mean, we don't have a budget for this project yet because we don't know what the cleanup's going to cost because of all these complexities, right? right? Okay. And then the second part is, have we gotten a legal opinion about whose responsibility this cleanup is? I'm concerned that we're asking the taxpayers to um, clean up something that may be someone else's responsibility, and that concerns me that we haven't spoken to the right people to find out if, in fact, it's not the responsibility of the school to do that. Can somebody speak to that? So we assign liability to the DEC through our statute 6615 where the owner, operator, or uh, BC um, is responsible. And so the owner of the school, I understand, it might be the city of Montpelier, and in the end, the city of Montpelier looks to their taxpayers to, to pay their responsibilities, whether or not um, the request goes through the school board or through the city of Montpelier is really not my decision, but in the end it comes down to the current owner of the property is responsible for implementing the required work that for my 
isn't ownership changing as part of the merger that recently occurred? So liability is joint and several, which means once you acquire the property, you get to keep liability forever and ever and ever. Um, regardless of your your culpability in causing the contamination as an owner, <laughs> you are responsible for the contamination on the property. There are opportunities that we've discussed with the school and the school board um, about a liability program that would allow the new merged districts to come in and get some potential liability protections and access to funding. Um, that's an ongoing conversation, but it's available to the, the new merged school district, not the current um, And if I can speak to just the tax impacts, it is much less expensive to you as taxpayers if it's paid through the school because of the fluctuations in the education fund. Um, if any of you have followed any of our budgets <laughs> at all, it's a very complicated process. Um, if Bill Fraser and the City Council approve an increase um, in your municipal taxes of 3%, you see a corresponding increase of 3% on the municipal side in July. Um, I think we projected a one and a half percent increase total last year, Michelle, and because of changes to the yield, you actually got some money back. Um, so it's if if there is a liability issue, shifting the cost to the city to say, hey, we get these buildings from you is ultimately going to be more expensive in the end because at least with this whether we do it through capital funding, whether we do it through a bond, all of that gets calculated through the education fund. And so since we're a state-funded system, those of us who live in Williston would be helping you pay for this in the same way that you as Montpelier residents help my family pay for education in Williston as well. So it's a little easier due to the complicated nature of our education funding to run these types of projects through the education portion of your some of you may know, though, that we, we did um, go speak with the city council last um, June. We had originally hoped to construct last June, uh, during the summer last summer, and uh, as a result of discovering that we had some issues with our soils that then triggered a need for more sampling and some planning around the corrective action, we had to shift back a year. But we did go to the city before we were really certain we were going to be delayed to seek some funding in particular in support of the stormwater um, mitigation pieces, the pieces that really helped to deal with stormwater better on the site. And the rationale for that was that there's an impact to our local waterways from the sediment, pretty considerable amount of sediment that washes off our site because of the way it's situated in a big basin, uh, and there's a lot of water coming through. So I do think um, that we could have a conversation with the city, uh, because we're in a new budget year now, about the possibility that the city might think of uh, those stormwater improvements being beneficial as a demonstration site for what constitutes good stormwater management in the city of Montpelier. Uh, because it's a highly visited site with a lot of visibility, and I think we could try to make that case to the city and see if they can find some money that's really part of their efforts to implement the master plan for stormwater management in the city. So that's a, um, it's a possibility uh, it it might, wouldn't be debt financing. I think it would be asking them if there's any room in their next year's budget to help support that part of the project. Are there plans to do that, sir? Um, well, yeah, there, there are. I mean, we, yes, there are. And I think if people are interested in that piece, you should definitely you know, jot your name down or come see me. And, and we'll think about the best timing for it. We haven't had a conversation with the city manager about when we might be on their agenda, but I think it's a good step to take. Do we have a couple questions right here? Uh, yeah, I have a question about what happens with the PAH contaminant over time? Is it degraded? It sounds like it's been a long time blocked in. And, I, and then the other part of it, I know the design has been going on for many years, but is it at all feasible to consider designing around the contaminants? 
come up with spots rather than taking I was kind of wondering if that was where the, the legs of the swing set question was going. I think the investment in redesigning around the contaminants would be like the cart before the horse in terms of there's a lot of cut that is going to happen based on the design that we shared from SE Group and engineering ventures, some of which is actually critical to changing the stormwater on the landscape. So that's one piece of it. And others that are just functionally <coughs> critical to make it a good play space. So if you try to say, well, let's not cut as much, the only thing you can really do is kind of <coughs> cut it anyway and mound it someplace else. And then you're mounding on site some of the soil, but not the purple soil, and it starts to open up just another round of testing that is also expensive. So it's there's no way it would happen next year if we redesigned, in my opinion. I mean, I don't know if other people. I mean, the, the it's uh, this all is happening because people want a better playground for this community and the school, and I think that would be. If it was just one area, I would be excited to look into that. But I think because of the, as you get to the two foot, the area shifts and below four feet, it shifts again. Like you start to, it'd be better to work with this design. And as Kurt was saying, like the final budget and the final, the cap, that acronym, <laughs> the corrective action plan will depend on the design. So there may be a little tweaking around the edges, but I would, I would say, Everybody on this committee wants to err on the side of like, if we're going to dig a square foot, maybe go a square 18 inches because we want to be more conservative with removal, but not let's remove less to spend less because it actually takes it all back to square one. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions. <laughs> uh, you have, I was just going to oh, say that we actually sorry. had a technical meeting today where we were looking at contaminated areas and cuts on the site. Oh. So there were discussions oh. about how to best. your question about degradation over time all contaminants will de degrade over time but the, the rate and you know there's different rates for different contaminants given the fact that these are bound to soils relatively tightly you can't expect them to, to, to degrade at a rate to be recognizable so um, I think you need to assume that they'll, they'll remain at that concentration for quite a while but they'd be buried they would remain buried and because they're bound so tightly they won't move and it's a beautiful <laughs> I'm Laura, I'm the fourth grader here. And uh, I think that the renovation analogy is pretty applicable. You have this great vision for a house, and you find something that is maybe not completely in line with your plan. And so I just hope that we collectively can be as flexible as possible with um, not necessarily a, a redesign but but maybe some thoughts about surfaces um, that that would make the first and foremost objective of safety um, number one and, and then the natural elements and the stormwater I mean we might not be able to have it all if you're designing a be able to have it all, but let's try to get what we can out of this with the, with the money that we have and the timeline that we're under and the, the, the soils that we're dealing with. Uh, I'm, I'm also kind of curious if we're bound by any sort of funding sources that uh, require us to do stormwater. Is, is, is that, some, are we locked into all of those stormwater features? No, we're not locked into the specifics of the stormwater features. Um, from a grant perspective, we we made improving stormwater on the site one of the goals we articulated in our grant applications because the water, all the water on the site really makes it hard to have you know durable features and it, it causes a lot more need for maintenance and it's also an environmental impact. So we made that case in our grant applications 
but the funders aren't interested in really in the, very, the real specifics of what we're doing. We have gotten a stormwater um, operational permit. Am I doing that right, Kurt? <laughs> For the first phase, the upper playground, um, and that, you know, part of that uh, is a commitment to meet the practices that are in the stormwater man manual, right? The recommended or required, actually, practices in, in the stormwater manual from a and &R. And Trish, I don't know if you want to jump in and... I do want to point out we need to respect our babysitter's time tonight yeah, who are down the hallway. Yeah. So we are going to have to wrap up shortly, but if you, Trish, if you'd like to be the grand finale. Uh, no pressure. <laughs> I'm not sure what you want me to respond to, though. Um, oh, just if you had, if you had anything to add to what Trish said. Yeah, just that we need to be careful about what we do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, trigger a need for a stormwater permit, and along with that requirement comes uh, some uh, the need to address stormwater impacts that are coming from the site to local waterways. So, I can't do that. I'm not a stormwater, yeah. um, and I don't want to speak for them, but I know that they were at our technical meetings, and I missed the stormwater portion of the curve. The requirement to take them. But I know um, we we had a technical meeting today with all of the folks from A and R and from engineering groups and consulting group, um, just to make sure that all the bases are covered. That you know we tried our best to make sure we've identified and looked for the trees that continue, so that when this happens, there shouldn't be those other surprises like dry rot or um, bad electrical wires. So. So we think we've captured what's out there. We've worked with all the permits um, through the permit issues so that we can identify them so that we won't have something to pop up. And hopefully what comes forward when you see the corrective action plan has um, all the concepts for the playground, all the requirements for the DC, and we're going to have a great play space uh, for your kids and the community and the school. And I'll probably bring my kids here. Um, <laughs> Michelle and I want this playground in North Queens. <laughs> She's building parks in Northfield. <laughs> but I, you know, I know this is a hiccup, and it's nothing that every parent ever wants to hear about. But there's contamination on the playground. But the big picture is that the playground is safe right now, and we're going to make it even better in the end. And so, if you have more questions, and please do let us know if 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 there's any way in which you want to get involved. We're also having this little fundraiser that ends next Monday. You all probably have gotten information about it in your, your kids' folders. So um, if you'd like to you know, purchase some holiday stuff and have a portion of it go to the playground, we'd love to have your participation in that. And it ends a week from today. The timeline is quickly, Chris. Could you just remind everybody what the corrective action plan and the budget timeline is? Um, I just shut down that slide. I know um, I know that we're looking for a bidding process. Going back February, February, yeah. I just think we should think about the Yeah. Yes. Thank you. If you have our children, Mrs. Kane or Mrs. Kapoor, really thank them as well. And let's. Uh,